Hi friends, welcome. I hope you're having a lovely day today. If you're listening to the audio version of this, you probably don't notice anything different, but if you're watching the video version of this, you probably notice that my surroundings have changed tremendously from where I normally shoot. I have physically moved to a different location in my apartment. I'm in my bedroom for this video instead of my office. Now it would be fun to say that I've taken a trip to my Hawaii house, which I you know, normally spend this quarter in and decided to film some videos from there while I was there and even though I'm on a sabbatical because I just love I love creating content so much and but but if I was in my Hawaii house behind me would be like the ocean maybe some lava that'd be fun like a lava waterfall like in the Incredibles uh I just moved to my bedroom the reason why is in short form it was a way of refreshing myself for my content. I spent three hours in Starbucks this morning doing a hardcore focused planning session with green iced tea and my laptop. And it felt fantastic. And I have a lot of exciting plans. Today, however, I'm going to talk about a photographer. And his name is Jeremy Snell. He is actually a photographer and cinema photographer. He's based in New York City. And he travels around the world to take his photos. He has a lot of photos taken in, in rather exotic locations compared to many travel photographers, even. His photos have such a wonderful cinematic feel to them. And it's interesting because it feels like a lot of his photos are taken using a shutter button, uh, while a lot of his photos seem like they could have been taken straight from his films. I'm not sure. The good thing is that you don't need a shutter button click to create a photo. So I want to talk about those photos. I will link below to his things. He's very talented. Okay. The first photo of his I want to take a look at today is of an older man in India. It is a very simple photo, just a portrait of the older man. The background is a bluish dark color. Not a whole lot going on back there. Not a whole lot of context. The older man is wearing a headdress, orange, and uh, brownish, orangish clothing. Lovely white beard. The focus of the image seems to be on the man's eye. And the reason why I say eye is because only one eye is in the light. His other eye is completely in the shadow. And this is interesting because it focuses our attention on one side of his face specifically. It's an interesting technique he went after here. One thing that happens in different countries when you take photos of people is a lot of times they won't pose. We tend to do this in America. I think we were taught at Walgreens or with our family photos that we should smile and look really happy. And when you go to different countries, they won't necessarily do this. They'll actually give you a much more authentic expression, which is amazing. And in this case, I think that's what's going on here. But you see a very soft quality to the photo, which you see in a good bit of his work. It's one way he achieves a rather cinematic quality. I don't know exactly how he pulled that off here, it's, a, it's very interesting, the look he's been able to achieve, but I think it's fantastic. We have another one of some kids running in an incredibly dusty atmosphere, very low visibility, not a whole lot of context. You see some trees in the background, you see the sky, you see the ground, kids, silhouettes of those kids running. This reminds me of one of my favorite scenes from my favorite movie, Black Hawk Down. There's some kids running with some soldiers uh, in one of the scenes at the end of the movie. They're, they're running, looking back at the soldiers adoringly. The soldiers have just been through a hellish firefight, and you can see that the kids seem to appreciate them. They're excited to run with them as the soldiers are running away from the chaos that they were, they were just a part of. I forget if I had a, an orangish atmosphere, but it had a very dusty, low visibility atmosphere like this, and it reminds me of that, and I think that's that's wonderful. I'm I'm theme bundling here, and what I mean by that is I'm going to be showing you a bunch of warm orange photos and photos that are overwhelmingly orange. He has quite a few of those, 
And I think it's an interesting thing to take a look at what that means for a photo, having an overwhelming color as opposed to colors that bounce off of each other, like cool tones and warm tones. In this photo, you sort of get a feeling for the place through the use of an atmospheric quality. You don't feel this so much if this photo was not so dusty and the, there was more visibility, you have more context, because it emphasizes uh, a feeling that you would have while you were there. If the dust got kicked up and you're in the middle of this bizarre situation, the sort of aesthetic bizarreness immerses you into a, a, a feeling of a place more than the visual aspect of it. And I think that uh, that's done very well here. We have another one taken in India, once again extremely orange, just as orange as the last one, but much higher visibility, although it's very minimalistic. We have a portrait of a man with some, some pretty epic hair standing, uh, sort of a, a side profile view of him. He has his hands put together in front of him, standing there straight up very stoically. And we see just a little bit of light on his face particularly right below the eye. The eye is the most important part on the face if you're trying to tell a story of a human being. So this, this is a very interesting use of lighting. You still see detail on the rest of his face as well. Um, you see his beard and the outline of his overall body against what looks like a sunset in the background. This looks like this could have been taken in a studio, but I believe it was not. I'm going to guess that this was taken outside. I think I see the sun peeking through behind. And I love it when I can see photographers use natural lighting to achieve something that some photographers can only achieve and can't even achieve with artificial lighting. Uh, it's really beautifully done here. There's a soft vignette around the outside of the frame that focuses you in on the subject. I don't tend to use vignettes in my work, but I love to see when people use vignettes and use them well and thoughtfully. Uh, there are lines going through the background, which is interesting to me. I think one of the things this illustrates, and I don't know if they're power lines, I'm not sure where the lines come from. Uh, like I said, very low context, but these lines are interesting because simple things add intrigue to a background that is otherwise devoid of any detail. They they take something and shake it up a little bit. And I think that's interesting. Um, and also there's a dramatic angle to the way he's shooting. He's kind of pointing up at him a little bit. And you see that in quite a few of his shots. He has very dynamic portraits. And we'll get into more of that as we go. Another one of either a child or an incredibly youthful looking old person looking out a window, light coming through the window from the outside world, concentrated on the face, particularly in the eye area. It feels like it could be from a movie, this scene. It feels that way for many different reasons. One reason being because of the carefully constructed orange color palette we have going on here. It's minimalistic, not a whole lot of colors going on. Brown, orange, shadows. There's a splash of purple on the kid's shirt. Uh, also, the framing feels carefully constructed. We have this widescreen 60 by 9 or beyond quality, which can quickly give any photo a cinematic quality. Also, the exposure is lowered from what you would see from many different types of art, uh, lots of different types of photography, or even filmmaking, where you want to strive for a more accurate exposure. In movies, one of the things I love is that they're not going necessarily for accurate, they're going for aesthetically wonderful. And one of the ways they do that is by lowering the exposure. Uh, allowing more shadows in. This allows you also to put focus in specific places easier, where the light really pronounces itself much more. This, to me, is an example of his acute awareness of light around him. It looks like he's really paying attention to where the lights and shadows are and how to create contrast between the two. In this case, we have the light concentrated on the eye area of the kid looking out the window. He saw that. He saw that light and said, maybe I can put the kid in front 
of that window, have the light streaming in, make everything else very dark, and come out with a photo that is horrible. So, moving on. Another one taken in India. The previous one was taken in Uganda, by the way. We have a woman walking up a sandy hill with a pot on her head. It's an evening scene with a vibrant, beautiful orange sky. The woman is contrasted against the sky. Well, half of her body is contrasted against the sky. The bottom half of her body is contrasted against the ground. And it's not so contrasted against the ground because the ground is a similar shade to her. There are, her and that side of the hill are both a silhouette. But there's a pleasing separation that's created because of how much of her body is contrasted against the sky. I think this is an interesting thing to touch on because if the photographer was at a higher angle to her, more of her body would be against the ground than the sky. And it would run the risk of having less separation and potentially being less of a pleasing photo. Potentially, but potentially. The scene is composed in a very organic but intentional and controlled way. The reason why I say organic is because it's split in half where you have the bottom half being the ground and the top half being the sky, but it's not perfectly split in half and it's also sort of at an angle. The ground sort of runs downhill from right to left. Also, she is organically placed in the scene where one of her hands goes below that point where the sky touches the ground and one of her hands rests just above with her fingers just going below it. It feels wonderful. There is an overwhelming sense of orange in this photo and it creates a mystical quality. You get this mystical quality that you would not get if you had a scene that was made up of more contrasting colors, right? More warm against cool, more normal scenes. And this immerses you by taking you into a bit of a dream world. I think that's absolutely wonderful, and you see that all throughout his work. We have another one taken in Liberia that is just as overwhelmingly warm as the previous one, but this time it's a bit more of a yellow shade than a, an orange shade. We have a girl peeking from behind a curtain, and there is a streak of light going across her eye, and I think this touches on, once again, his Im impressive awareness and control on light around him, how he moves things around in space to align in a way that a lot of photographers can't quite figure out <laughs> and need a lot of time and mastery to pull off, and this speaks to his time and mastery. The scene, the scene has an interesting split up into three different pieces with the wall on the left being this yellow wall, the wall, uh, the curtain on the right being this yellowish orangish curtain, and the girl directly in the middle. And it has, once again, a very cinematic quality for many different reasons, including the widescreenness. Uh, she has an authentic expression on her face. She's not really smiling. She's kind of just looking at the camera, and I think that's brilliant. Another one taken at Kilauea. We have a very small, distant man standing on the edge of what looks like a pit of lava. The composition communicates hugeness. Now, there are different ways that one could communicate hugeness in their composition. One way you could do that is by cutting off the edges of the pit and making it feel expansive and huge. Like when you take a photo of a building, a good way to make a building feel huge is to cut off the top of the building because it feels like it keeps going on forever. In this case, we see both edges of the pit. And what makes it work here is the fact that we have a man, which we know the size of, contrasted against this huge pit. He's tiny. The pit is massive. You feel an immensity, a power. It's a really wonderful photo. You see the darkness around the edges of the smoke, which is lit up by the lava. Another one that I really enjoy, taken in the Philippines, of a boy sitting in a dark room on a bed. Crisscross applesauce. Did you guys use that in kindergarten? He's holding an iPad in his hand. Now, the scene is very warm, once again, but we're starting to see 
some contrasting colors. We have the blueness coming off of the screen of the iPad contrasted against the warmth of the rest of the scene. But what makes this photo so interesting to me is it's a story of how we interact with technology. It looks like perhaps this boy lives in an area where he may have never been able to interact with an iPad, perhaps. I don't know, but I'm, I'm guessing that could be the case, right? And when you see this contrast of the boy interacting with a piece of technology and thinking about how he's interacting, what, what is he doing with it? What does this mean that he's using this? Is this helpful in his life? Is it not helpful in his life? Does it actually matter that much at all that he got to play with an iPad? Makes you think. Also, I think that the emotional contrast here, or the uh, the philosophical contrast that's happening, is mirrored with the contrast of the colors, if you want to think about it that deeply, with the blueness of the screen contrasting against the warmth of his environment. Hmm. Another one of a fisherman casting his net. He is in the middle of casting his net. The net is in a brilliant bloom as it makes its way to the water. We have a very cool scene this time, taken uh, in the morning or in the evening, hard to tell, beautiful light. But it speaks to the idea that, that he is very serious about the light he shoots in. Every one of his photos, the light is just spectacular. He's not messing around. And another thing that I think is interesting is we have we have an attention to detail of the composition. And one example of that is if you look at the edges, nothing is poking in in a weird way. And there's a lot of opportunities for things to poke in in a weird way because in the water all around him, you have these trees poking up with the shaven limbs. They look sort of like dead trees coming out of the water. Very interesting environment. But one of those trees could easily poke in from the side, and it would be okay if it poked in from the side, but in this case, there's there's nothing poking in, and also there's a separation from the nets that are sitting in the fisherman's boat and the side of the frame. It, you can tell he really thinks about his framings. Of course, the expression in this photo is tremendous. The, the fisherman with his arms extended as he's throwing the net and the net flying out in full, the only way I know to ex explain it is full bloom as it makes its way to the water. He also froze this motion well. Uh, now I don't know if he hit the shutter button to freeze this motion or if it was part of his videos. I'm going to assume that this one had to do with him hitting a shutter button because of the way the so it doesn't look like it was taken from a video. The cropping, for example, is like more of a, a squarish, 8 by 10 ish kind of ratio. Another one, also a fisherman. I assume this was taken around the same time as the previous one. This time the angle is quite a bit different. He looks like he has elevated himself and he's pointing down at the fishermen in their boat more. The entire frame is full of water, there's no sky. It's a minimalistic scene. The fishermen are silhouetted against the water. He's eliminated distraction here. Once again, very serious about light. There is such a wonderful vibe that's created here that if he took this photo at noon, it would be a completely different photo. Uh, the moodiness of this scene makes the photo more immersive. We have another rather mysterious feeling photo taken in Ghana. We have a person standing in what looks like a jungle. They're surrounded by what looks like leafy shapes and jungle trees. It's a very dark scene. There are leaves in the foreground out of focus, I believe. The brightest point is on the person's face, which is half covered by these leaves. We're, we're missing a lot of context. The overall scene very, feels very cinematic, once again. And a cinematic approach makes for a mesmerizing photo or film a lot of times. And this is good if you want to immerse people in whatever you're trying to share with them because mesmerizing means you can't take your eyes off of it. You can't take your focus away. It draws you in. And I think this is an interesting technique. Uh, using. I've watched many films where I feel so immersed in the the visuals, the symphony of 
of sounds and sights that I, I can't not watch it. I love it. I, I love the feeling of engaging with it. And because of that, the creator was able to tell me a story. Because of that, they didn't have to fight to tell me a story. It was a free flow. I want to touch on another one of his very quick, just to emphasize the repetition that you can find in his work sometimes. We have another one of a, a girl with part of her face lit up, brightest point in the scene once again, also standing in a dark, jungly sort of vibe. And it's a different photo in a lot of ways, but also exactly the same. And this is this is a glorious looking photo. In this one, we have a farmer in Cambodia. And we have tremendous context here. A lot of his photos previously, he's removing context. You don't quite know where you are. But in this case, we see the landscape where this farmer lives, where the farmer perhaps grew up, perhaps where the farmer spent years and years of his life. He has a we weathered wise expression on his face, which is really spectacular. We can think about his life. We can think about his life in contrast with ours, how different our life has probably been to his, how hard he works and how hard we maybe don't work. <laughs> So it's a really wonderful photo once again. Another one taken in Kenya of an older woman sitting inside somewhere with the background being this beautiful gradient of cloth from a bright yellow shade to a dark green from, from left to right. The woman has this, once again, wise expression on her face, but it's different than the last one. Her eyes are closed. She looks like she's deep in thought. She's pondering something. Uh, you can think about her life as well and what she thinks, what she knows that you don't know. This photo tells a rich story. This next photo is absolutely fantastic. One of my favorites from him. The composition is amazing. We have a woman standing in a red dress against a blue background of rolling mountains. This was taken in Nepal. The expression on her face is this lively, happy smile. Also, she has a lovely nose accessory, a headband and bracelets. She's holding a basket. And this is contrasted against this smile because the basket probably involves some work for her. But she seems like a very happy person. So you have these two elements that are competing with each other. And it, it tells the story of how being happy is about your inner state more so than your outer circumstances. Ah, oh, man, this photo is amazing. Another killer portrait of a woman in Ethiopia, young. She looks like she's carrying a water container. There's beautiful, uh, looks like late evening light. She has a nice bit of light on her face that maybe it was artificial, maybe it was natural. Either way, I'm very impressed. There is a perfect harmony between her and her environment. If it was a wider shot, you would have had more of her environment, less of her, totally fine. If it was a tighter shot, you would have had more of her, less of her environment, totally fine. But there's a, a harmony here that is really special. She has this rich, serious expression on her face. She seems like somebody who thinks quite deeply. And I love that he was able to express that here. Another thing is that I have... I have relatives that look like her because my wife is half Haitian. So she has family members who are from Haiti. Now, obviously, people from Haiti are not people from Ethiopia. But, um, I, but I definitely see visual similarities that make me connect to her. And I, I, I love that. I think an interesting context point is the water container. What if she was not carrying that water container? What if she happened to not be and the photographer did not decide to work that into the photo. We would not have that context. Maybe she was carrying it and he decided not to have it in there for some reason. That would be dumb, but you know, we make some dumb decisions like that that remove important context from a photo and remove an important story that can be told. 
We have another portrait taken in India that is quite different to the previous portrait in a lot of ways. We have a woman standing with a pot on her head. Maybe it has to do with the previous woman we saw with the pot on her head. She's wearing a, a head cover that's covering her entire face. Very aesthetically beautiful. She is at sort of a side profile angle to us. And so this speaks to the dynamic nature of how he either poses or how he takes the photo when those people are standing in a certain way, what have you. His portraits end up being very dynamic. You see a lot of different versions of what he can create. I love how beige the overall scene is with this splash of red running throughout the, the scene dramatically. Uh, the pot sits on the horizon line, which I think is is interesting and possibly intentional. And I also like the idea that this person who is visually bizarre comparatively to a lot of us is just like you, if you want to think that way. Just like you, even though they're, they have a lot of differences. Um, anybody from another you know place in the world has a lot of differences than you. The person is also just as similar as they are different. In another one taken in Cambodia, we have a picture of an older lady with a lovely smile on her face. She's looking up. She looks very hopeful. All of the context has been removed from the background. And the entire emphasis of this photo is on the woman. There's nothing competing with her. And it creates a very personal photo. This is something that you can achieve. Uh, you could have achieved with the previous photo of the young girl with the water container on her back, right? He could have gotten in closer and made a more personal photo, but the choice is yours. In this case, she has such a wonderful expression and such a a, a rich happiness exuding from her that it takes over. That. You don't have to provide any environment for this to be a terrific photo. Now, this next photo is dramatically different than the ones we've been looking at so far. We have part of the New York City skyline, a foggy night scene. We have a bridge that starts close to us on the left and shoots into that skyline, acting as a sort of leading line. This photo brings up something that I want to touch on. The fact that skills and styles transfer. In this next photo, we have a woman walking in an urban environment. You could easily replace her background with Ethiopia or India, and you would see that the photo is very similar to the ones he has achieved before, although, you know, the clothing she would be wearing would be kind of strange if she was standing in the desert. The style that he's cultivated over years, unless he's some sort of robot baby demon who can accelerated learn... It has it has um, transferred from place to place seamlessly, and I think that's fascinating. I love that you can build up your skills in one facet of photography and transfer them to the other. You will never start in a bad place in photography. Pick something that you're interested in and start to develop your skills around that thing. And if you ever want to shift over to another thing, you have a lot of skills over here and probably a special perspective that you can easily transfer. Now, the last couple of photos I want to touch on really quick demonstrate the power of the single photo, but also the photo collection to tell a compelling story. We have different shots of kids interacting with water. We have one shot of a girl drinking the water, close-up detail shot, the water splashing on her face. Uh, another shot very similar of a boy smiling while the water's hitting his hands. We have a girl holding a clean ga glass of water. We have another one of somebody holding a clean glass of water in one hand and a dirty glass in the other. And in these photos, we see all of the directions a creative mind can go when trying to tell the story of the importance of clean water. He has incredibly dynamic work, and he has chosen to apply it to saying something meaningful. He also put in the effort to get to the stories he's trying to tell, and this is something that I think holds a lot of us back, that can hold me back, for sure, from compelling stories, is the 
intimidatingness of going to another country that's maybe a, a little bit scary, makes you a bit nervous, and just staying in your safe bubble. Well, you might not be able to tell that story that is in your heart that you've always wanted to tell without being ambitious and, and getting outside of your box. Another thing is that he speaks to the idea that you can master one style of art and then expand into other facets of that art. But you have to be careful because you can go to me directions recklessly and end up diluting your work. So you have to do that with great care. But I think that's about all I have to say about Jeremy Snell. Uh, his work is fantastic. I would encourage you to check out his video work as well. I will link below to his things. I would love to hear about your thoughts about this, what I spoke about. And also, um, tell me about people who you would like to see me talk about on this series. I hope you have a lovely day. Goodbye.